Amen. Thank you, Stephen. The scripture says, call to me and I will answer you. Doesn't say he might. He says he will answer us and show us great and mighty things. What a great promise that we have today. Take your Bibles with me today and turn to the last chapter of the Gospel of John, John 21. Today we conclude our message series uh, that we've been studying all summer long through the Gospel of John that we've entitled Believe. I trust that your belief, your faith has grown. We started looking at that verse in John chapter 20 where John simply said, I've written these things so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so I trust that, that your faith, your belief has grown during these summer months. Well, this morning, I begin like Brad did last week. Last Sunday, Brad began with a confession, if you'll remember. Brad confessed that he struggles with loving unlovely people. How many of you struggle with that, by the way? All right. About six of us. All right. So, so the rest of us must be the unlovely, unlovely people that you struggle with, right? Wasn't Brad's message powerful last week? It was powerful. I appreciate that. So like Brad, I want to begin with a confession today. And I'm serious. I know sometimes we joke, but I'm serious. So today I begin with a confession. I'm an idolater. I struggle with idols. Now, now, let me clarify what I mean by that. Vicki and I don't practice or secretly practice Hinduism at our house, all right? There's no Buddha, statue of Buddha at our house that we go and rub on a regular basis. But that doesn't mean that I don't struggle with idols. Although my idols are not relics, they're not statues, they're not deceased spirits to whom I speak, they are nonetheless equally dangerous in my life. And by the way, the idols that you have in your life are equally dangerous as well. You say, Brian, if you don't struggle if you don't have a, a, a statue in your house or a relic, what are the idols with which you struggle? I struggle with acceptance. To me, acceptance is a, is a huge idol in my life. I love it when I post something on Facebook and you hit the like button. You have no idea what that means to me. <laughs> the, 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 I just make, doesn't that sound carnal? Just to even say that sounds carnal. I want you to know that, that, that people liking me it is really important to me. And I don't say that in a, in a good way. At times, it, it takes more importance in my life than my relationship with God. And I struggle with that. I worry at times about doing something, not that it's the right thing to do, but I worry about how is everyone going to feel about that? How will the, you know, five, six hundred people in our congregation respond to that? I struggle with that. And I admit that acceptance often, very frequently, is an idol in my life. I struggle with ministerial success. You, you said, Brian, what do you mean by that? Listen, I want our church to be as successful as any church. I love getting together with other pastors and bragging on all of the great things that God is doing at Hollywood Community Church. But if I'm not careful, that becomes an idol in my life. And it becomes more important to me. Sometimes what I do as a pastor is more important to me than the God whom I serve. I'm just being transparent with you today. I struggle putting my family before Jesus. I know that I shouldn't, and we'll look at passages of Scripture today that... that, that that tell us we shouldn't do that, but I confess there are times in my life when I elevate my wife and my kids and my grandkids above my relationship with Jesus Christ. You might sit back today and say, oh, hold on a second, Brian. Wait a second. Those are all good things. To, to be a pastor is a good thing, right? To, to be a, thank you, all right? 
Who, who clapped over there? I want, I want to know who that was. All right, thank you. All right. To be a pastor is a good thing. To, to be a husband is a good thing. To love your kids is a good thing. But it becomes an idol when that becomes more important. When I love that person, when I love that thing, when I love those accolades, when I love Hollywood Community Church, when I love ministerial success more than I love Jesus Christ, that becomes an idol in my life. You see, catch this this morning, church, an idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart, anything that absorbs your imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give you. And that thing, that person, that desire at that moment becomes an idol in your life. Tim Keller makes this statement. It's a powerful statement. He says, an idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then, I, then I'll feel like my life has meaning. Then I'll know that I have value. Then I will feel significant and secure. Man, if I just owned a house instead of rented a house. If we, if we didn't have a car payment at this moment, why, if I had an iPhone 10 instead of an iPhone 7, if this person was in my life, if only I were married, if only I had a better job, if only, if only, and we elevate these things in our life to the position of most importance in our life. And we chase after those things we chase after those people more than we are chasing after God. And when that happens, it becomes an idol in our life. You see, an idol can be family. An idol can be children. An idol can be your career. It can be in making money. It can be, as in the case of Brian, the acceptance of others. An idol can be a romantic relationship. It can be security. It can be your intellect. It can be your beauty. Why, yes, it can even be ministerial success. Doing something that's of value, doing something that's right, doing something good. But when we elevate that above Jesus Christ, it becomes an idol in our life. So can I ask you this morning as we begin, this is, this is deep stuff. Is there anything or anyone that you love more than Jesus Christ? Would you think about that today? Would you let that question just kind of sink in your mind and in your heart? Is there anything this morning or is there anyone whom you love more than Jesus Christ? Today's scripture passage is found in John chapter 21, and, and you'll see how all of this correlates with the passage this morning. John chapter 21, quite frankly, is one of my favorite chapters in the New Testament. It is just filled with material. It's filled with stories. It talks to us about Peter, and I relate to Peter because as often as Peter put his foot in his mouth, Brian puts his foot, my foot in my mouth. I relate to Peter on, on a regular basis. And so uh, I kind of want us to dive into this chapter. I'm not going to take the time and read all of the verses. Before we begin in verse 15, let me just kind of set the stage for what is ta happening as this gospel concludes. Jesus has already died, was in the tomb for three days, and is resurrected. He has already appeared to several of the disciples on several occasions. He appeared to them as the risen Lord. You'll remember the story that he, appeared, that he appeared to Thomas, doubting Thomas. Thomas said, you know what? If I don't see the nail prints in his hands and his feet, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus appears to Thomas and he says, come over here, put your, hand, put your finger in my hands, put your finger in my feet. And Thomas believes all of that has already transpired. As John chapter 21 begins, we find seven of the disciples on a boat in the Sea of Galilee fishing. The text seems to indicate that Peter initiated 
this fishing expedition. In verse 3, Peter makes the statement. He says, I'm going fishing. Sounds like a pretty innocent statement. If I said today, I'm going fishing, how many guys are going to go with me? That would seem like a pretty uh, innocent statement. Peter says, I'm going fishing. And six of the other disciples accompany him. Many, though, have interpreted Peter's statement to mean that Peter not only was going out just on a one-day fishing expedition, but that Peter had given up on his life as an apostle. After all, you remember that he had already denied Jesus Christ three times. Not once, not twice. He denied Jesus three times. In his mind, he was a failure. Why? I might as well return to my previous occupation. I was a better fisherman than I am an apostle. So Peter looks at the other disciples and said, I'm going fishing. Anybody going with me? The text tells us that the disciples fished all night long and caught nothing. Interesting, because these were expert fishermen. And so they had fished the Sea of Galilee many times. And so they went out in familiar territory and fished the Sea of Galilee all night long. And the text says they caught nothing. As daybreak approaches, Jesus stands on the seashore and he calls out to them, have you caught anything? Jesus yells out to the disciples. No, they respond, uncertain who the man was. It was still dark. The sun was just beginning to come up. They couldn't make out who the man was on the seashore. No, they responded, we haven't caught anything. So the gentleman who at this moment, they still were uncertain who it was, yells out. He says this, put your net on the right side of the boat. Evidently, their net was on the left side. And so this gentleman, whoever it was, gives him a recommendation. Take your net and put it on the other side of the boat. Hey, you know what? What do we got to lose? We haven't caught anything all night long. So they took the net and they put it on the other side of the boat. And the text says that the net immediately filled with fish. So much so that they couldn't even reel it in. Later in the chapter, you can read, all the fishermen are going to want to know this. There were 153 large fish in the net. You can tell that Peter, those guys were fishermen because they counted every single fish. They probably mounted one or two of them on their office wall. I'm not exactly sure. John suddenly realizes that the man who calls to them from the shore is none other than than Jesus. And and John cries out, it's the Lord. And the text says that Peter, realizing that it's Jesus, jumps out of the boat. He actually tucks his garment in and jumps out of the boat, runs through the water, and runs toward the shore. Jesus is there. He already has a fire going. And He invites the disciples to come and eat breakfast with him on that early morning there beside the Sea of Galilee. Wonderful story up to that point. But it's at this point that the story gets extremely personal because there sitting beside the fire, Jesus has an intimate conversation with Peter. An intimate conversation that completely changes Peter's life. And completely changes Peter's perspective. Those are the verses we want to read today. So would you follow along beginning in verse 15? So all of that has transpired. The disciples are now around the fire. They've caught 53 fish because the Lord's omniscient. He knew exactly where the fish were. And they sit around the fire, ate breakfast. And verse 15 says, and when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus looked at him and he simply said, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter responded, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. 
He looks at him a third time and he says, Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me? The text says Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me as we probably would have been as well? And now he says to him, Lord, you know everything. You know my thoughts. You know my emotions. You know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, so now he gives a prophecy to Peter. When you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands. Another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. We read that and think, well, that's ambiguous. What does that mean? John gives us the meaning. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. After saying this, he looks at Peter, who had denied him three times. He looks at Peter and he says, follow me. Follow me. Would you pray with me today? Lord, we come to you this morning as idolaters. None of us want to admit it. Hurts our ego to admit it. Hurts our, 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 our Christian pride to admit that there's anything in our life that is more important than you. But Father, quite frankly, I doubt that there's anyone here that's better than Peter. Just as Peter, Lord, we struggle with elevating you to the position of supreme importance in our life. Doesn't mean we're bad people. Doesn't mean that we do bad things. We just have a tendency to place other things in front of you. To love other things. To love other people more than you. So right now, I just pray that the Holy Spirit of God would speak to us. I pray that, Lord, you'd take my inability to explain this passage and just drive the truth home to our heart and life as only you can. And my prayer for every person here today, my prayer for me today, is that we would love you more than anyone, more than anything. Work in our lives, help us to accomplish that. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Peter's response here is very us-like. In other words, I would say that we frequently respond to life struggles much like Peter responds to life struggles. I've just tried to summarize this chapter in a couple of practical ways. And so just a couple of simple truths that, that are on your outline today if you want to follow along. The first thing I wrote is this. Spiritual failures demonstrate that we love someone or something else more than Jesus. Spiritual failures demonstrate that there is something in our life, someone in our life that we love more than we love Jesus Christ. The context of this story goes all the way back to John chapter 13. If you remember, all the way back in John chapter 13, Peter had boasted that he would never abandon the Lord. If you remember that, Peter had made that declaration. He had told the disciples he was going away, and Peter said, where are you going? I'm going with you. Why, Jesus, I want you to know that I'm willing to die for you. Wherever you go, I'm going all the way to death. You know the story, Jesus looks at him there in John chapter 13 and says, Peter, 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 you say that, but you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, no way, not going to happen. I'm willing to give my life for you. Yet when push came to shove, and Peter was faced with the opportunity to publicly declare his loyalty to Jesus Christ, bold Peter wilted in the face of adversity. His cowardice at that moment caused him to deny Jesus not once, not twice, but three times on the same night. His denials are found in John chapter 18, if you want to read them later this afternoon. 
You say, Brian, man, what happened? This was, the, this was bold Peter. This was the leader of the bunch. What happened to Peter at that moment? Quite frankly, I believe that at that moment, Peter's love for Jesus took a back seat to the opinion of others. He, he was more worried about what the people around that fire thought about him than what Jesus thought about him. At that moment, he loved his reputation. He loved his life. He loved whatever it was that provoked that cowardice inside him. At that moment, he loved that more than he loved his Savior, who was right in front of him. It's easy for us to read this story and sit back and say, how could he? How could Peter have done that? I wouldn't have made that mistake. And quite frankly, there's a good chance you probably would have, and I would have as well. You see, because like Peter, there are times in our life when we are faced with a crucial moment. We're faced with an opportunity to stand up for Jesus. We're faced with the opportunity to do the right thing, to make the right decision, to respond the right way. And for some reason, in those crucial moments in our life, we blow it and we fail. And we respond in a way that we shouldn't respond. So, so, Think with me for just a moment today. Take just a moment and remember the times that you have failed the Lord. I'm sure you don't have to go very far back in your memory. It's not like you got to go back months and months. You probably can think of some occasion this week, excuse me, <coughs> some occasions this week in which you failed the Lord. Maybe you lost your temper. Maybe you and your husband had a huge blow up. Maybe in a moment of loneliness, you gave in to lust and you watched pornography. Maybe in a moment of discouragement, you turned to alcohol and you drank too much. Maybe you got so busy with family activities that life became all about family and you disconnected from the body, Christ's body. Maybe your desire for things for new things, put you in a financial bind. Maybe it's something else that I'm not even mentioning today. Quite frankly, each of those failures happened. Each of those failures happened because at that moment, you, at that moment, I loved something else. We loved someone else more than we loved Jesus. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Well, when you lose your temper... When you blow up at your wife, when you blow up at your husband, at that moment you're demonstrating pride. And pride is what? It's a love of self. And at that moment you love yourself more than you love Jesus. And it causes you to respond incorrectly. Sitting there in front of the computer watching something on the computer dwelling on pornography is caused by lust, which is what? Which is a love of sinful pleasure. And at that moment, you love that sinful pleasure more than you love Jesus. Drunkenness is caused by self-pity, which in turn is a love for ourselves. Unfaithfulness to the body of Christ is, is loving family more than we love Jesus. Financial difficulties is driven by materialism, which is a love of things. You see, all of us struggle with that. John tells us in 1 John, he said, don't love the world. Don't love the things of the world. Because if you love the world, if you love the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. In other words, you can't love two things to that degree simultaneously. You see, as Jesus sat around the fire with Peter, he realized the real motive behind Peter's denial. So in his conversation with Peter, Jesus gets right to the point. Jesus doesn't beat around the bush. He gets right to the point. And he asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? What is the point that Jesus is trying to make to Peter? And what is the point that Jesus makes to us? It's this, church, catch this. It's the second point in your outline. It's so very important. 
Jesus desires for you to love him more than anyone, more than anything. Jesus desires for you to love him more than you love anyone else, more than you love anything else. And so to drive that point home to Peter, he asked Peter the exact same question three times in a row. It's interesting. You said, Brian, man, what is it? What is the point that Jesus was trying to make? Man, theologians have talked about this, and that's why this is such a fascinating passage to me. Some say, well, he's talking about the object of the love of his love because Jesus looks at Peter, especially in that first question, and he says, Do you love me more than these? And the question is, to what does the word these refer? Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? To whom or to what was Jesus referring? So some would say that Jesus looks around to the other guys around the fire, his buddies that they that, that they spent you know three and a half years together. And and Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than these guys? Do you love me more than James? Do you love me more than John? Do you love me more than these guys that have been your closest, most intimate friends for the past three and a half years? Others would say that he's talking about the fishing equipment. (laughs) But he looks at Peter and says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter, do you love me more than that boat? Now I'm getting personal, aren't I? Huh? Do you love me more than that boat? Do you love me more than that net? Peter, do you love me more than you love to fish? Do you love me more than these? Some go all the way back to John chapter 13 and say, Jesus is referring to Peter's boast where basically Peter stands up and he says, Lord, I love you more than the other disciples do. Because I don't know what their response is, but I want you to know that I'm willing to die for you. They're probably not, but I am. And some would say that Jesus is asking him, do you love me more than these guys love me? Not exactly sure. The text is completely ambiguous. But the, but the question just kind of hangs there, does it not? Do you love me more than Let me ask you today, do you love Jesus more than you fill in the blanks or the blank? Do you love Jesus more than your spouse? Do you love Jesus more than your free time? Do you love Jesus more than your family? Do you love Jesus more than success? Do you love Jesus more than the favor of others? See, Jesus is telling Peter, and he's telling us, I desire for you to love me more than anyone. I desire for you to love me more than anything. Others say that Jesus was talking about the measure of his love. If you know anything about the passage, you know that there's a little bit of play on words. So Jesus looks to Peter and he says, do you love me? He uses the Greek word agape, which is, which is that highest form of love. And he asked Peter, Peter, do you love me with the highest, most sacrificial form of love? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, I love you. But Peter responds with a, a lower word. Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you with brotherly love. And so Jesus asked him again, Peter, no, no, no. Peter, do you love me? Do you agape love me? Do you love me with the highest form of love that there is? And Peter's like, Lord, come on. I love you. I love you with brotherly love. And the third time, Jesus lowers his expectations and says, Peter, do you love me with brotherly love? And Peter responds that he does. So some would say that Jesus was, was prompting Peter to love him unconditionally. That, that Jesus was prompting Peter to love him with that sacrificial highest love. By the way, that's the love that God desires for us to have for him. He doesn't just want to be a friend. He doesn't just want to be our buddy. He doesn't just want to be our go-to guy. He wants us to love him with that highest degree of love. 
As a matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, he says this, whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You see, Jesus raises the bar on discipleship. And Jesus says, if you're going to truly be a follower of mine, if you want to be a disciple of mine, here's what I desire from you. Here's what I expect from you. I want you to love me more than anyone or anything. I want to be the most important person in your life. Is Jesus the most important person in your life today? There's a third thing, and I wish we had time to dwell on all of these, because I think that the third thing that we see in the passage that's clearly articulated is that Jesus graciously desires to give us a second chance. This is, this is so cool. Remember, and, 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 and by the way, there's some Bible scholars that don't believe that Peter had thrown in the towel, and so we're not exactly sure why Peter said, I'm going fishing. But, 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 but remember, at the very least, Peter was discouraged. At the very least, he was, he was upset. He was defeated. I, you know what that feels like. You place these expectations on yourself and you don't live up to your expectations. Whether they're spiritual expectations, whether they're career expectations, whether they're family expectations, and, and you blow it. And, and the person who is most disappointed in your failure is not your husband or your wife or your kids. The person who's most disappointed in your failure is you. Because you know that you blew it. You had an opportunity and you blew it. So, so here's Peter. He had denied the Lord, not once, not twice, but three times. At best, Peter's discouraged and defeated. At worst, he's thrown in the towel saying, I'm not sure whether I'm cut out to be an apostle. I'm better off fishing. After all, I've denied the Lord not once, not twice, but three times. Three strikes and you're out, right? I'm not sure whether they paid baseball during New Testament times, but three strikes and you're out. So, so catch this, please follow me, don't lose it. So Jesus appears to Peter on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and he asks him about his devotion. He asks him about his love, not one time, not two times, but how many times does Jesus ask Peter, do you love me? How many times? three times. Do you see it? Do you catch what is taking place in the passage? Do you see it? Why does Jesus ask him three times? Obviously, Jesus knew after the first time whether Peter answered correctly or not. Jesus is omniscient. He actually knew Peter's emotions before Peter answered the question. He didn't ask Peter the question for himself because he already knew the answer. He asked Peter the question three times for Peter. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Third time, Peter, do you love me? Catch this, church. Catch this. He is telling Peter that his three denials did not disqualify him. He hadn't lost his opportunity. Jesus was giving him a second chance. Theologians would say it this way, that Jesus is clearly restoring Peter's apostleship to him there on the Sea of Galilee. He's looking at Peter saying, Peter, okay, man, you blew it. You're disappointed. I get it. I'm disappointed, but I want you to know you're valuable to me. You, you are an important part of my team. Peter, do you love me? If you love me, feed my sheep. Here's what he's saying, Peter, I am not finished with you yet. 
And by the way, he goes on and he tells them, he gives that ambiguous prophecy. He said, when you were young, you know, you were kind of in tight. But when you get old, they're going to stretch you out. And he gives that, 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 that ambiguous prophecy. Here's what he's telling Peter. And, and John comes through and he says, he said, John describes all of this. He said, this he said, signifying what death Peter would die. That same phrase, stretched out, is a phrase that was used for crucifixion. It was a phrase that was used describing Jesus' crucifixion. And so Jesus looks to Peter and says, Peter, here, let me tell you what's going to happen in the future. Peter, Peter, you are going to be faithful in the future. You, you denied me in the past. But I want you to know that when the next time comes around, you are not going to deny me. Peter, you are going to be faithful, and you are going to be so faithful that you will give your life for me. Tradition tells us that Peter, later in life, was crucified. And that Peter, when he went to be crucified, realized that he wasn't worried to be crucified as the Lord. And tradition states, whether it's true or not, we'll know when we get to heaven, but tradition states that Peter says, crucify me upside down. And Peter was crucified upside down. Jesus is telling him, I'm offering you another opportunity. I'm offering you another chance. Your denials do not disqualify you from being used by me. As a matter of fact, if you'll go over just a few pages to Acts chapter 2, and we won't take the time to go there, it is Peter who preaches the sermon on the day of Pentecost when 2,000 or more people give their lives to Jesus Christ. The Bible is filled with people who received second chances and even third chances and even fourth chances. Peter, Jonah, Mark, Samson, David, and others were all trophies of God's grace. They weren't trophies of their ability to pick themselves up by their bootstraps and do something different. They were trophies of the fact that the grace of God is greater than all of our sin. And that Jesus, because of what he did on the cross, can reach down in our failure and pick us up off the seashore, move us away from being a fisher of fish, and he can make us once again fishers of men. And he looks at Peter at the end of the passage and he says, follow me. <laughs> follow me, the exact same command that is found in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus called Peter the very first time. You say, Brian, what's that mean? Let me ask you this morning. Do you think you've blown it? Are you here today and you think that your sin has disqualified you? Your sin has put you on a shelf and made you of no value to God. Please know today that because of Jesus, not because of you, because of Jesus, God desires to give you a second chance, or God desires to give you a third chance, or God desires to give you a fourth chance. Peter, follow me. We got a lot of work to do and you're going to be involved in my work. Listen, if you're here today and we meet with people on a regular basis who have blown it, that think that their time is up, that God can't use them anymore, I'm here today telling you it does not matter what you've done. The grace of God is greater than your sin. God's love for you is deeper than your failures. And God desires to reach down and to forgive you and give you another Opportunity. Let me show you one more thing, and I'm done today. After asking Peter whether he loved him, Jesus gives Peter an assignment. I find it really interesting that Jesus didn't say, Peter, do you love me? Go to church on Sunday. <laughs> it's not what he told him. Peter, do you love me? Sing a worship song. That's not what he tells him. Peter, do you love me? Make sure you put an offering in the offering basket as it comes by. All of those, I'm not minimizing those, all of those are, are demonstrations of our love for Jesus. But that's not what he tells Peter. He, he looks at Peter and he says, do you love me? And he says the same thing three different ways. He says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. 
Here's the fourth thing I want you to catch this morning, church. The fourth thing is this. You demonstrate your love for Jesus by ministering to others. Catch that. You demonstrate your love for Jesus by ministering to others. That ties in perfectly with Brad's message last week, does it not? (laughs) A reckless love for Jesus translates into a reckless love for others. In other words, we cannot say that we love Jesus and not love our brother. We cannot say that we love Jesus and see someone who's hungry and not fill their stomach. We cannot say that we love Jesus and see someone who is destitute and without clothes and and not meet that need. Why is that? Because a reckless love for Jesus motivates us, translates itself into a reckless love for others. The more we love Jesus, the more we love others. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Take care of my flock. Feed my lambs. Minister to others. Follow me and do what I originally called you to do. Matthew chapter 25 says this. These are such powerful verses. I'm going to put them up on the screen. Follow with me. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 42, Jesus says, For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you didn't clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. They will also answer, say, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you a stranger or naked or sick in prison and didn't minister to you? Of course we would minister to you. And Jesus will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you didn't do it to me. In other words, you're saying, he's saying, if you don't love them, you don't love me. A reckless love for Jesus translates into a reckless love for others. You see, when we love Jesus more than anyone or anything, that propels us to love others just as Jesus loves us. Church, we have a community who desperately needs the love of Jesus Christ. This past Wednesday, I got up early and went to the gym I say that just so you know that I'm working out, all right? (laughs) Tighten my muscles as I say that just a little bit. I I went to the gym and put on the elliptical and turned the TV on. And I immediately, the first thing I see was a reporter in our parking lot. And I'm like, oh my word, what's going on now? And if you know what's going on, there's a gentleman on 62nd Street, our neighbor, who, who did something horrendous. Did something tragic, did something crazy, I get it. But my heart's broken because he was our neighbor. We could throw a stone and hit his house and he's our neighbor. And today he's out in eternity. My question is this, did we show the love of Jesus to him? Oh, I hope to God. He knew that there was a church here on the corner of 441 and Taft that loves him. I'm not sure we did. And I'm burdened and broken with the thought that maybe we failed him. But we have thousands of people in our community who desperately need to be loved. And God's called us to be his living representatives. We love them, not because they deserve to be loved, not because they're lovely, We love them because we love Jesus Christ. Do you love me? Really? Do you love me more than anyone or anything? Feed my sheep. 
Do you love me more than anyone? Love the people around you. Demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ to others. You see, quite frankly, church, the reason that we're not reaching our community for Christ is not because there's no power in the message. There's power in the message. The reason we're not reaching our community for Christ is that we love other things and we love other people more than we love Jesus. Oh, God help us to love him more than anyone or anything. Would you stand with me? Stephen and the team are coming. Would you just do a personal evaluation of your heart today? Do you love Jesus? Let me first of all declare, and I'm sure you know this, he loves you more than you could ever imagine. If you're here today and you have never by faith trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, let me, let me just say very click, quickly the gospel is the fact that God loved you so much that he gave you the greatest gift, Jesus Christ, who came and died in your place, the just for the unjust, so that you being dead in your sins, can have life in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you've never reached out by faith and trusted Jesus Christ, that's the starting point. And I would encourage you to do so. We'll have elders and deacons down front that would love to take the word of God and show you how you can know for sure that you're a child of God. But I'd venture to say that I'm speaking the majority to believers, people who would declare to be followers of Jesus Christ. Would you do just a personal evaluation? Is there anything in your life? Is there anyone in your life who you love more than Jesus? Stephen talked about that idea of raising your hands means that I'm taking my hands off. I'm surrendering. If there's anything or anyone in your life more than Jesus, man, now's the time to say, okay, God, I'm taking my hands off. I'm loosening my grip on that. I'm loosening my grip on that person. And I want you to be the most important person in my life. Lord, thank you for the lesson here in John chapter 21. Thank you for your patient, loving care for us. Thank you that you went looking for Peter. And just as you went looking for Peter, you look for us. So God, I pray that you'd help us to call out to you with the knowledge, with the full knowledge that when we call out, you'll answer. Pray that you'll do a work in our heart and it's in Jesus' name we pray.